synth. Uh, what is MPE? It's MIDI polyphonic expression. What does that mean? It's MIDI, so that means it's backwards compatible with almost all of the existing MIDI stack and toolchain. I mean, never underestimate how big a job. Anytime you get annoyed with MIDI and how it sucks, just think about how big that whole stack is, how much would have to be re-engineered re to kind of supersede that horrible old 7-bit uh, protocol. Uh, it's backwards compatible, forwards compatible, great. It's polyphonic, it's about playing more than one note at a time. If you're only playing one note, uh, then MIDI already has all the expressive potential you need, but this is about polyphonic uh, expression. Um, at Rolly, uh, we sometimes call it uh, the five dimensions of touch. Uh, now these are, you haven't got the fonts on here, Dimitri. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> ah, <laughs> we've lost all our nice uh, symbols. Um, <laughs> The, the five dimensions of touch, we call them uh, strike, which is how hard you hit a note, uh, glide, which is uh, kind of pitch going up and down, pressure, which is uh, pressing in, uh, slide, which is, if you like, the Z position on the, uh, on the keyboard, it's where on the key you're, you're playing, and then, um, and then lift, which is lifting off from the key. So I have a Seaboard controller here, which I should be able to play some of this. We get a little bit more level on that. So you can hear. So there's velocity, that's familiar, that's pressure, aftertouch. So you can slide up and down, hit the bend, and then depending on how you lift off the key, you can get different, uh, different signals going when you, um, when you lift off. And although this has this kind of uh, fancy name, five dimensions of touch, some of you more mathematically, scientifically minded are probably thinking there are only actually three dimensions there and that velocity, off velocity and pressure, you know, they're just, it's just a delta pressure by delta time thing. Scientifically, you're correct. Uh, the marketing guys love this, so I leave it up to them. <laughs> Um, and in many ways, this is actually a familiar, um, familiar territory. Uh, so velocity, these are the, um, the sort of hex values of the MIDI messages. So they're our old friends, velocity, um, channel pitch bend, channel pressure, not poly pressure, uh, slide, which is a dedicated uh, controller message, CC74, and then uh, note off velocity, which has been part of the MIDI spec since the beginning, although not uh, widely supported. Um, like I say, in a sense, it's, uh, in a, sense, it's, it's a kind of minor uh, iteration, but it enables, uh, it enables a lot of new stuff. So if any of you are familiar with MIDI uh, mode four, uh, this has kind of been in the MIDI, uh, MIDI uh, spec uh, since very early on. If you've ever used a MIDI guitar controller, this is a variant of the MIDI spec, which basically lets you send uh, one note uh, per channel for the strings on a MIDI guitar so that you can do uh, things like the slides and bends that are, that are possible on a, on a guitar. Um, and then Poly Aftertouch obviously has been around since, uh, since the 70s, since the um, CS80. Again, not that widely supported until recently because it's sort of expensive to do and uh, you know, relatively few keyboards and synths uh, supported it. Uh, so MPE. Um, operates in MIDI mode three, which is kind of what we really think of as uh, MIDI. It's polyphonic, uh, omni-off. It can also operate in mode four, which is a monophonic mode, and it's using uh, channel aftertouch rather than, uh, rather than uh, poly aftertouch. So uh, to kind of recap, or well, for those of you who aren't familiar with the kind of lower levels of MIDI, here is a uh, MIDI message, so that's a three byte, uh, that's a three byte message, and those are kind of the hex values, and in that first uh, byte, you've got the message type, which in this case, a nine means a, a note on. It's on MIDI channel six, so for some reason, MIDI channels, we refer to them as one to 16. Uh, MIDI controllers, uh, we refer to from zero to 127, so you get this kind of mismatch in how those, um, how those hex values are interpreted, but have to deal with that. 
We've got the note number in the middle. Uh, that's going to come in important later. That's a, that one's a middle C. And then 7F, full velocity, so it's, uh, it's a 7-bit uh, number there. How do we use that in a synth? Well, here's looking at kind of at a high-level uh, theoretical architecture for a synth there. Now, any of you who are new-ish to building plugins and C++ may be thinking, well, when I get a note on, uh, I can just allocate a new instance of my voice class. Do not do that. Bad things will happen if you do that uh, because the MIDI is typically coming in on the audio thread. You mustn't allocate new objects in the audio thread unless you've got your own uh, lock-free heap manager or something clever like that. Realistically, probably having a pre-allocated pool of voices that are warmed up and ready to go is the, uh, is the sensible thing to do there. So we get a note on. Uh, we can see there that's, um, that's a middle C on our, on our keyboard. Uh, it hits the voice allocator, which chooses one of the voices, and it's now bound uh, voice uh, number one to, uh, to that middle C, uh, such that when we get a note off, it can kill it. Great, that's your basic model for, for voicing uh, in, a, in a synth there. Now let's go to MPE, and we replace our keyboard with a nice little um, seaboard block there. Again, we receive a note on. But what you'll see here is we're binding on both the note and the channel number. So this 93, so that note on, on MIDI channel 4, remember they're out by 1. Um, and uh, so what, th what that's saying now is that any MPE messages that come in on that channel are going to be sent to that specific uh, instance of the voice in the voice pool. So we might get something like this, where the note goes on. There's then a pitch bend message on the channel as we move down the seaboard. Uh, maybe a, a slide message as we move across the seaboard, and then a note off uh, to uh, to release that uh, to release that voice. Not necessarily kill it straight away, but it will go to the release phase. It will no longer be bound to the MIDI channel, so it's no longer receiving any uh, controller data after that point. So what this lets us do, and this is kind of where the power of MPE really, really comes in there, is clearly you can have multiple uh, control, control streams going at once for one uh, keyboard uh, performance there. And you can sort of see that you've got uh, the, first, the first note there that's then being pitch bent. Um, and then a second note uh, comes in. And again, that's got the slide controller. So if, if this is a polyphonic sound. I'll that's actually a monophonic sound. Let me see if I can find something poly. Uh, let's look in the keys. Uh, so you can hear, uh, I'm not a great seaboard player, but um, you, can, you can hear that there are multiple independent uh, control signals uh, going on there. Simple, right? Well, almost. Um, there are a few complications with MPE. I'm not going to go into all of them in, in great detail right now. Uh, Dimitri's going to deep dive on, on some of that. Uh, let's have a look at some of the things that you have to be aware of here. Um, first of all, uh, the MPE uh, spec has this concept of zones. And zones could represent either um, something more like a key, uh, key split, a conventional, you know, you've got your bass on your left hand and a pad or a piano on your, on your, on your right hand. Or they can even be upper and lower zones. Say you're playing something like a continuum, uh, you can actually split the, uh, the the surface kind of in half and be playing one sound at the front of the surface and one sound at the back of the surface and actually have overlapping notes. Because you know some people are still using MIDI on a physical uh, kind of DIN plug connector with a single logical set of channels, uh, they wanted to support that. And the channel uh, spanning for this can vary, so that can be configured. Uh, during the session to basically change the channel uh, range assigned to each of the two zones. Um, another thing we have to be aware of, MIDI, once you go beyond your sort of simple level of note-ons and note-offs, it's not atomic. Now, if any of you have dealt with NERPEN messages in the past, which are these sort of uh, uh, wider-ranged uh, MIDI controller messages where you can basically send like a select message and then select high, select low, and then a value as three different messages, that's no longer atomic. Those are three different events. 
And when you're merging streams or rearranging things, that can cause you uh, all, all sorts of problems there. And one of the things that we have to do for MPE, because, I mean, with a seaboard, when you play at a note on, it plays, um, you know, it will always play in tune. It doesn't allow uh, kind of in-between note tuning at the point that you strike the key. But there are plenty of MPE controllers that can do that and that do allow that style of playing. So we want to be able to se send a, a pitch bend message before the start of the note. So you kind of need to be tracking that before you trigger the note. Be aware of the state of uh, pitch bend and slide. Uh, not pressure, because by definition, if there is no note yet, there is no pressure on the note. Uh, but you kind of have to track the uh, state of those uh, controllers. And uh, when you're working in a, in a, in a door, in a host, uh, they don't guarantee anything about the ordering of events that have the same timestamp on them. So there's various kind of bits of fudging you have to do to just make sure that the events that actually are supposed to arrive before the note uh, actually do. It's not ideal, but it works uh, well enough. Uh, pitch bend ranges is another thing that you have to kind of be uh, aware of. It's plus minus 48 is the default for MPE, but it is uh, configurable. Um, and then with uh, slide, so this is this controller message, uh, CC74. Uh, slide is transmitted as an absolute value. So it will transmit as here is the position on the note from the, typically the front to the back. You could have a different physical arrangement to that. Um, but it's transmitted as an absolute value, although when you're actually playing it most of the time, what you want is a relative value. So let's say you're playing a percussion sound, you might want a different timbre in different places when you contact the key. But for most things, what you want to be able to do is play anywhere on the key, and then bring in whatever the effect on CC74 is uh, via the slide. So you need to think about sort of absolute to relative um, conversion there. And then finally, when it gets to uh, the sort of more advanced operations, which Dimitri is going to talk about, uh, merging, binding voices to channels, channel reallocation, and building things like arpeggiators, things get a little trickier. And we'll uh, cover that a bit more later on. Um, so Dimitri has done some work on building MPE synths in Juice. And I think you're going to show us how to build one. Right? Uh, yes. Over to you. Um, so hi, I'm Dimitri. I work at Rolly as a software engineer. Um, so yeah, I've worked on, what are we looking at? Building MPE synths juice. Yeah, I've worked on quite a few of the Rolly pro products in some form, either in QA or, or software engineering. Um, so I was anxious to show you the low level details of MPE. It's, it's not super complicated, but it's not something you want to be thinking about all the time. So really you want to abstract that into some higher level representation. Um, and luckily for us, Juice has, Juice has a set of classes that does that already. So I'm going to talk you through them briefly and then show you a little example of the, of the code. Um, so it all starts with your MIDI stream coming in. And this goes to the Juice uh, MP instrument. Um, so the MP instrument is going to pass the MIDI stream and create an array of uh, MP note uh, objects. Um, uh, so this needs, the, the MP instrument needs an MP zone layout, like Angus talked about. So this is kind of the, the configuration of your MIDI stream. It needs to know which, uh, which channels are going to be notes, which channels are going to be global channels. Um, and then it also has the Juice uh, MP instrument listener. So this is the callback class that if you are a Juice MP listener, the Juice MP instrument will send you callbacks for uh, changes to notes. So that looks like this. So you've got note added, pressure changed, pitch bend changed, uh, time changed, key state changed, and note released. Uh, and so each one of those comes with a copy of the MP note, so you can quickly adjust your sounds from what's happened there. Um, so if you're making something like a visualizer, you're probably going to want to interact directly with the MP instrument um, and the MP notes. If you're making a sound generator, then Juice has given you even more. There is the Juice MP synthesizer, 
So this adds a basic voice allocation to the, the MP instrument. Um, uh, so you, you create MP synthesizer voices. This is where most of your work happens. Your DSP work <laughs> is going to happen. Um, so you give the MP synthesizer a set of voices to use, and it will look after all the assignment of uh, notes to voices and the allocation, so the architecture Angus talked about. Um, and so the MP synthesizer voice, this is essentially representing a single note, and it has a similar interface for you to, of callbacks for you to override. Um, so notes start, notes stopped, pressure changed, pitch bend changed, time changed, and key state changed. Um, so that's the, I've, made, I've simplified a little bit, but that is basically the synthesizer classes in Juice. Um, should mention, I think most of this was written by Timor here, so he can answer the really tough questions <laughs> if he remembers any of it. Um, my next slide says, let's make a synth. Um, whilst I've just been debugging it five minutes before the talk, I'm not going to do any live coding, but I will show you through the code and show you where stuff happens. Yeah, I think I was overambitious to think I could live code. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just need to get my monitors back to seeing each other. Can everybody see that? How's that? Bigger? A bit bigger? How's that looking? Um, I should mention, all this stuff is really well documented in Juice. There's tutorials. Uh, if anybody's familiar with Juice, the, the headers always have very uh, good descriptions of what all the different methods do. So that's why I'm going over it fairly fast, because you can find all this information online anyway. So don't want to waste your time with stuff that you can actually just go read yourself. Um, so I'm assuming most people are familiar either with Juice or just generally how an audio processor would, would work. We're getting a, a stream of uh, a buff, uh, buffers of audio to fill and buffers of MIDI data that links that audio. So, so the the building blocks of our synthesizer are. So here I have an ADC ADC synthesizer class that I've inherited from the MP synthesizer, and all I've had to do here is. Um, give it a number of voices at initialization. And then, what am I doing? I'm just, I'm just uh, setting prepare on each of those, uh, on each of those voices. Um, so this is when the kind of audio details come through, sample rate, expected, buffer size, and things. Um, and the Juice MP synthesizer is going to take care of all the rest of the allocation logic for me. So then the more interesting part is the synthesizer voice. So here, um, I'm, an, so I'm an MP synthesizer voice. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, I've used the Juice DSP uh, processor chain and their processor object. So you can see down here at the bottom, uh, I've got an oscillator, a ladder filter, and a gain. So the interesting part for, for this talk is the, um, is the callbacks here. Um, so when my voice gets assigned a note, uh, note start will get called back. So when note starts, I, I want to update the frequency. I'm going to update the level of my note. Um, and I'm going to update the filter for, for I mean, these are, my, these are my aesthetic choices, actually. It's kind of up to you what you do on each parameter. But So I'm thinking about, I want the, I'm going to put the filter on the Y value. I'm going to do pressure on the, on the uh, X, X, X axis. And I'm going to use level on the pressure. I'm not sure my Y is working. This is what I was trying to do just before the talk. <laughs> Maybe if somebody can spot the, uh, the mistake. 
Um, so when the, a note stops, um, I've, I've made an end note function because there's a few things I need to do there. I just wanted to point out that there is this allow tail off. So that's going to tell you if your voice has time to have a tail or if it's going to, if there's no, um, if there's voice stealing going on. And there's a load of parameters you can set up in the uh, MPE synth to decide what are the note stealing rules. Um, so I've decided on pressure change, that's where I'm going to update my levels. On pitch bend change, I'm going to update the frequency. On time change, I'm going to update the filter. Uh, so let's look what's actually in those functions. So in update frequency, um, so I get the current playing note. So, so a voice will only have, have one note associated at a time. And um, uh, so this comes back as an, uh, this is an MP note, which has a helpful function, get frequency in hertz. So this is going to be the, um, the default note value plus any pitch bend on it, and then it'll calculate into hertz. So that's done quite a lot of the hard work for me, <laughs> and I can just send that directly to the oscillator. Um, when I'm updating the level, uh, so again, I get the current note, I get the pressure, um, it might be interesting to look into that, what the pressure is. This is an MP value. Um, so because the MIDI values can come in as, some of them as 7-bit values, some of them as 14-bit values, Juice have kind of normalized this in an MP value class, and then you can ask for the value back in, in a load of different forms. So you can get it back in 7-bit, 14-bit, um, unsigned floats, signed floats. So here I'm... Here I'm always using the unsigned float, so that's going to give me a 0 to 1 value. Um, so there I'm just setting the, the gain. This is the bit that I was desperately trying to get working. Ah, there's, okay, there's the problem. I don't want that line there anymore. I'll rebuild that. Um, okay, so update filter is a little bit more complicated because, so one way that MP synths can work is, and quite a few do that are currently out there, is with this kind of relative value for the timbre. So, so, so yeah, I hope you can see on, on screen is showing the actual position that I'm pressing. Oh, no, it's not. It's showing the relative position. Um, oh, actually, my keyboard is set to set relative as well. It's a little bit complicated in the MP spec how this relative stuff works. But basically, there's your initial uh, where you've pressed. And that comes before the note on. And then there is the updated values that come after the note on. And so the initial before the note on value is used as a center position. And everything is plus or minus relative to that. So you can see this little bit of code here. I'm calculating a relative value. Obviously a little, a little messy to do it right in line like that. I should have a, a help function for this. <coughs> um, We'll talk about this a bit more in a minute where we get into the more kind of sophisticated MPE problems that you might face. Um, but this is really up to the, the designer's discretion decision. How do they want to use the, M the values that are being given to them? So like I said, this is quite, in the synths I've seen, this is quite a common uh, choice to make. But nothing says that you have to do that. And you have the raw values to decide how you use them. Um, and then in the end note, so I'm setting my gain to zero, and importantly, I'm calling clear current note, which lets the voice allocator know that I'm finished with, with uh, this voice. Uh, so if you're going to put a tail on the note, you need to keep hold of the voice until you finish the tail and then tell it uh, clear note. Um, so to do a simple synth, a simple synth it really is uh, that easy. It's probably also worth showing quickly what I've done with the visualizer. Um, because they, uh, here you've got like some uh, thread safety concerns. So in my plugin processor, I have a couple of classes. I have the visualizer instrument, which is just an MP instrument, and the uh, and uh, what I've, a class I've made, an MP visualizer data source. And so what I'm doing in every buffer, 
I'm passing all the MIDI data into my visualizer instrument, which is creating this array of, of MIDI notes. And for this demo, the way I've, just, I've chosen to handle it, my data source is a fixed array of notes. So I'm, in the way I'm handling data, I make sure it's never going to allocate. And I'm using try locks to copy from the MP instrument into, the, um, into my data source class, and also try lock to access them. So because so my, my GUI is refreshing at 25 frame, uh, frames a second, but I don't really mind if it drops a frame, especially for this demo. So there's, there's some more sophisticated ways to do it, but for demo purposes, this kind of works. Maybe, I'm not sure, I feel like I see some confused faces, so maybe I'll just show the code for that little bit. So here, update visualizer data. So I iterate through all the buffer messages and send them into the visualizer instrument, which is an MP instrument. That's going to look after creating the array of MPE notes for me safely. And then I push that into my visualizer data source. S uh, and then separately, the other side of that, my GUI, uh, 25 times a second, is asking the data source, can it go and get whatever the current um, uh, notes are? Um, but it's all done on a try lock. So if, I'm, if I miss one frame, I don't really mind. And it keeps it thread safe. Um, Cool, so that's probably enough of my scary coding bit. And I'll go back to the safe slides. Mm, not that one. Um, so, yeah, hopefully this kind of convinces you that making an MP sound generator, visualizer, if you're using something like Juice, it's actually pretty easy. Um, there's there, a lot of the implementation details have been taken out of your hands. Um, something that doesn't have such great libraries and tools around it yet is when you want to do more advanced stuff when you're generating MPE <coughs> and especially when you're editing MPE. Um, and we discovered at Roly in some of our products, there's a lot of uh, gotchas that you have to be careful of. So I'm going to give you a few examples of things that can happen here. And hopefully, it will, anybody who wanted to do that kind of stuff, you'll go into the right kind of mindset of how to think about MPE data um, so that you can avoid these kind of problems. Um, so channel clashes is one to be aware of. So whenever you've got multiple MPE sources coming together, to go through one uh, sound engine, you're risking uh, potentially, again, channel clashes. Um, so let me give you some examples of, of this to make that a bit clearer. So when you're recording overdubs to a single track, you might be using the same instrument. And every overdub you record, uh, the instrument isn't aware of what channels have already been taken up. And the recording isn't aware, well, I guess the, record, the recording isn't aware of what channels you want to use. Um, so potentially, you're going you're to put in data that is using the same channels you've already used. Um, in, in the Roly Noise iOS AU, we have an on-screen keyboard that produces MPE, but we're also receiving buffers from the host, which are uh, potentially MPE as well. Um, so again, this is actually really it's the overdubbing problem again. We've got two sources potentially channel clashing. Um, this is probably quite a Roly specific problem, but if you've seen uh, so these Roly block products we have, they can snap together to make larger surfaces, but really each one is generating its own MP data stream, and as the messages gets passed along, again, we need to make sure that we're not getting channel clashes. Uh, and the last one I've put on here, but it's kind of a special mention, an honorary mention, is um, if you've got recorded MPE notes, and you move them around, again, you're potentially you're going to move a note on, on a particular channel to overlap with another note on that channel. The examples I'm about to give you now won't, will solve the first three problems. It won't solve the last problem, but you'll, you'll have the right way of thinking about it. I'm sure you can work out how to deal with that one yourselves. 
Um, Talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, you can ask me more questions about that. Um, OK, so here is, I wonder how I play video. OK, so here is free soloed overdub takes. Uh, so you can hear what the source material is. Um, and now, so now I'd like to play you those three takes going directly over each other to see what could happen. kind of like how it sounds, but it wasn't exactly, <laughs> wasn't what I was expecting. So what's happened here is on the second and third takes, um, they've, the, the last notes on the second and third takes have ended up on the same channel. So when this gets sent to the sound generator, so the pitch, the pitch bend messages have just been merged directly by the door, just put on top of each other. Uh, so you can see that along the bottom in the automation lane. And when this gets sent to the sound generator, it will split the notes between the voice allocation, but it doesn't. It can't tell which pitch bend messages belong with each note, so they both just get all the pitch bend messages. Um, so, like I said, there's a few, and so I'll give you a few different examples where it just it's a very similar problem. So, what we did, I think we first saw this in in the noise app, and so what we've did there is um, give each recording take or incoming source an ID, so we know exactly where something has, wh wh which um, notes belong together, basically. And then during playback, we keep track of um, the active channels that are coming through from each source. And then we do a live remapping of any clashes before it goes to the sound engine. Um, so you can imagine in that overdub example, there's three sources there. So we have, uh, well, we have two, two remappers, I guess, in a chain. So source one and two go for a remapper that keeps track of what's, what's, um, what channels are being used by them. And if, it's, if there's potentially a clash, it will shift one of the channels. Uh, and then that merged, that merged version with take three will then go for another remapper doing exactly the same. Um, and that's uh, the class that we use is actually available in Juice in the MP channel remapper class. <coughs> um, so now I'll give you the example remapped or what it is. Oh, we done. <laughs> uh, have, have. That, that, no, that was that was from another room. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, I think that's okay. Crossover on the mic. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> um, it sounded like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh well, so if somebody does have a question, you can. <laughs> go. Um, yes, we could make it available online. I didn't plan it, but we we could do. Uh, so is that coming from from here still, or? <laughs> Next door. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Is it going to be? Um, uh, okay, so next kind of area of problems is adjusting adjusting notes. Um, so quantizing is a good example of this. So I think this is going to be an original, the original recording followed by the quantized, uh, kind of the, what, how you'd quantize single channel MIDI. So you heard in that second example, the notes are on the beat now, but the tone of the instrument is totally different. So why is that? 
Um, originally, I was going to show you this, and we were going to stare at it for a long time and work out what was going on. But last night, I stayed up late, and I learned how to make animations in Keynote. <laughs> uh, hopefully, this is a bit more understandable. So uh, I've used the blue lines to represent a note on and a note off. And these three colors, you can see the key at the bottom, to, for the different uh, MPE-type messages that we're concerned with. So importantly, on, on the far left, oh, and time is going from left to right. So on the far left, we have these three uh, setup values. Um, so when we're talking about what I was talking about before, this kind of relative time changes, these setup values are really important. <laughs> so, um, so when we do like a kind of, uh, the kind of normal quantize you'll see in a door, in a door that's used to single channel MIDI, this is hopefully what will happen. We just move the note on. And so essentially, we've, lo we've lost the, the relative values now. They're coming in the wrong place. It's undefined behavior. We don't know what the, how the synth is going to interpret this. Probably whatever the last values were from the, the previous note is going to be considered the relative value. So if you heard in that broken example, everything, the time had kind of shifted in weird ways. So what we really need to do when we're quantizing MP MIDI is also move those initial values. There's still a slight problem with this because we have, now we have this gap after the note on where we're also in a bit of undefined territory. We're probably going to end up being whatever the initial values were for that very, that little time slice there. So what we do in noise is also move, though we go find the first values for each, um, for time, channel pressure, and pitch bend, and also move those back so they happen directly after the note on. <coughs> Another way you might tackle the same problem is to move the whole note, including those values. There's a bit of a musical decision to make here because we are changing the, the sound of the note now. Um, and then here is the fixed. Um, and so now I'll quickly show you cutting MPE notes, which is a very similar range of range of problems. Oh, hang on, sorry, my video was meant to play there. So in that, in that, so in the second take, like uh, sonically, it didn't sound unpleasant. It sounded fine, but it's not what I expected. As the user, I expected it to be more like an audio cut, and I wanted the timbre to be the, the. So I think I cut it on bar three, and I wanted the timbre to be the timbre of bar three. So you can hear in the last, the last take that was preserved. So, again, the MIDI events. If you're really interested in that, or my hopefully nice animation. So uh, the raw cut was like this, and all it's done is shifted the, on, the st uh, note on. So now our relative uh, time change becomes that yellow dot before the note on to that yellow dot after it, and this is actually quite a small change compared to the original recording. So again, what we need to do is go, when we do a cut, we need to go find the initial values move them up, and also the last, the last values before the cut to move them directly after the note. So again, this is what we've done in our um, iOS app noise. Um, uh, so I think now I'm handing back to Angus to talk a bit more about the aesthetics of MPE. Yeah, yeah, so we'll have a, we should have about um, five minutes to take some um, questions at the end. Uh, but before we do, I mean, I I'm guessing that a lot of the audience here are um, plugin developers, virtual instrument developers. So, you know, there is, there is implementing the protocol that is the nuts and bolts of receiving the messages. 
And then there's what you actually do with that information once you've uh, once you've once you've got it, and that's sort of something that we put a lot of uh, research <laughs> into. A really very atmospheric. I like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to need a bigger mod matrix basically to do something musical with all this lovely expressive data. So I'd like you to think out of the box a little bit right now um, in terms of sound design as being a user experience. Normally we think of UX as being a kind of visual design meets information architecture kind of a discipline. If we're talking music, then actually our users experience uh, playing, performance, and sound. And the kind of classical model with uh, plugins has been uh, we make an instrument, and then the musicians make some <laughs> presets on them, or sometimes you might uh, ship them a library of fairly, um, fairly kind of uh, static presets. But really, what we're thinking about here, certainly when we design instruments at Roly, is how to empower this guy in the middle. So over on the left, we've got uh, Jolt, uh, DSP engineer, and possibly serial killer. Um, <laughs> Uh, so working working at the at the kind of the, the code and algorithms and kind of synth design level, and then that in the middle is uh, Raphael, who's our sound designer. So he is kind of a musician turned scientist, um, uh, synth wizard, and knob twiddler, building presets on those synths for then uh, somebody like that's Marco, one of our uh, product demonstrators, a musician, to actually play uh, on the on the seaboard. And you can probably imagine that. You know, when you're creating a sound that can be interacted with in so many different ways by the end user, that's pushing a lot more work onto the sound designer's uh, plate than they may be used to. So we have to build tools that make it easy for this guy in the middle to, to, um, to get his job done there. I mean, I will say this is not the only way to go with MPE. You can, you can build um, MPE products without uh, thinking in that way. Uh, this is uh, granularized on the left, which is a, um, a granular synth that uh, somebody built in as a Maximus P patch for the uh, seaboard rise. It's a lot of fun. And on the right is the, um, the Swam uh, Sax engine, fantastic uh, MPE instrument, also uh, integrated into uh, Roly, uh, Roly Noise, or the, the engine from this is. And this is not about giving something big to sound designers to create new patches for end users. The developers of this product are really creating the sound of that saxophone and then putting it straight into the user's hands uh, to play. So the kind of building a big synth for a sound designer isn't the only way to go, but it's, a, it's an interesting problem to solve. So uh, let's uh, talk about that a bit. Uh, so this is kind of the evolution of uh, the, the, the kind of mod systems that you need uh, to really drive one of these uh, synths. Anyone from uh, Clavier Nord uh, in, the, in the room? Oh, that's a shame. So um, this was kind of one of the um, inspirations, although that is a long way before MPE. You know, th 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 that's, um, you know that's, a, that's a fish, and we're on, uh, we're on mammals now. Uh, but a very influential, very um, inspiring product, because what they've done is taken these enormously complex modular patches that you could create with it, and then map that out onto a sort of fixed set of uh, performance uh, controllers. Similarly, if there's any um, dead mouse fans in the room, um, I still get inquiries about this weird thing that he streamed on YouTube once 10 years ago, which was um, a prototype uh, of expansion synth that was never really supposed to leave the building. That's artists for you. Um, but that is a kind of an SH-101 inspired synth that had the beginnings of this, of this mod system. Uh, synth Squad is kind of the, the sort of commercial derivative of that. And then in, in 2013, the Seaboard Grand came along. Here we are almost at MPE. This thing is, uh, there, it has multi-dimensional like, polyphonic expressive MIDI, but uh, not yet the MPE standard. And then uh, along the bottom row here is the kind of, these are the modern day uh, fully, uh, fully MPE uh, compatible uh, synths there. Uh, so Rolly Equator and the two F expansion uh, synths. And really the key to all of these instruments is the ability to map uh, control signals coming in from something like the seaboard onto uh, any of these uh, kind of 
any of the parameters that are going on in the, um, in the synth engine, giving the sound designers the tools to make a, um, a sound that really moves around expressively in all sorts of different dimensions as, as people play. Um, what do the sound designers <coughs> excuse me, ask for in, in doing this? I mean, the number one thing is these, uh, these curves. So if you're building a product that supports MPE, it's not enough to be able to just say, oh, I'm going to take my slide value and map that to filter cutoff uh, 0 to 1 full range. You, know, you need to be able to map it over a, a, over a set range and you need a, a depth. That's part of it. But then you know, as you have these multiple axes of control interacting, it's really important to be able to tame the sound, like say adjust the gain based on the value of one or more parameters. So these sort of transfer function curves, uh, these are the ones at the top here are from Equator. And actually for each of those different dimensions, it's got four, um, <coughs> four assignable curves uh, that basically let you, so let's say you're opening up your filter with pressure, but that's making your sound too loud when the filter opens up to full brightness. You can have another curve there that's then reducing gain a little bit uh, just as pressure reaches its full value. And that, that, that's, the sort of, um, that's the sort of thing you can, you can do with that. So um, in, in Equator here, uh, those are the s supposed to be the five dimensions over on the uh, left there, the five, uh, the five curves. But you can have the five dimensions of touch there and the uh, performance uh, controllers that you'll find on a, on a Seaboard Rise. And you can map those onto both sort of the, the modulation generators of the synth. So here, here you've got a, an envelope. So you could take the velocity and map it onto attack time. Um, and then also map all of those things um, onto, the, um, onto the synth engine there. Um, similarly, uh, Cypher 2, um, again, you have these sort of modulation generators uh, at the top. And then this is uh, kind of mapped <coughs> out via a mod matrix that lets you do some sort of math functions so you can take one input and multiply it by another and then send it to a destination and, and that kind of thing. But it's all designed around making it very fast and intuitive because the sound designers are having to churn out you know, pretty significant uh, libraries of sounds. So being able to work really quickly with this, having a very intuitive way of patching modulation, assigning mod depths. This isn't the one answer. There are many ways to solve that problem. But if you want to build uh, this class of product, you have to think about how you're going to make things really fast and really friendly uh, for, for the sound designers. Because at this point, they are pretty much uh, programmers in their own right, albeit visually and not writing in code. But designing a, uh, a kind of plausible musical <coughs> space that somebody can navigate through with one of these controllers is a, is a kind of programming task in its own right. Um, and that pretty much brings us uh, to the end. Uh, the MPE specs are there online uh, on, uh, on midi.org. So that's an officially ratified uh, MIDI standard now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, juice, uh, the juice classes that um, Dimitri uh, alluded to for parsing uh, MPE. And we'll be adding some of those uh, utilities as well um, as those are fully, kind of fully reviewed. Uh, the traction engine. So traction has, as some of you will probably know, traction has just gone uh, open source. Uh, and they have one of the best MPE implementations out there of the various uh, doors. Um, there are a few good ones. Logic's reasonable. Bitwig is very, very good. Um, GarageBand is surprisingly good. Ableton have still got a bit of work to do. They'll get there. Um, <laughs> But uh, yes, uh, Traction, because they've worked uh, closely with, uh, with Roly for a number of years, uh, they have a really strong MPE support there. And for those of you working uh, with uh, WebMIDI, uh, that's a, um, a JavaScript uh, parser available there as well. Any questions? Uh, the, the, you mean the slide controller specifically, the CC? Uh, the CC. Because uh, I can imagine that it would be nice, maybe if you have absolute values, then you can um, hit 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the the keyboard is sending absolute values, but internally we translate it to both a relative controller source and an absolute controller source. So you can you can have a that you can build patches that use the the absolute value, and you can use patches that that uh, work with the relative value. I mean, uh, do I? Maybe I can, I think I can answer this. Uh, yeah, so what is in the standard is that before the note on, you should send these setup values, and then after the note, you're sending the actual values. So then it's up to the, the user of them, the sound engine, to decide if it wants to make a relative conversion. So you are receiving the, the actual values, but the, important, the, the bit that is in the standard is that you need to send these uh, setup values before the note on. And that's and so that makes it up to the the sound uh, the sound engine designer to decide how they what they're going to do with that information. Uh, but if you're getting the message before the note on, what do you do with regular MIDI? How do you mess with uh, with regular MIDI? Uh, what do you do with uh, regular MIDI? Mm -hmm. You can have multiple notes on the same channel. Yes. So how, what are you doing with uh, detection before before the note? Um, so. Uh, I think this is one of the, so I did have a slide, the ugly bits of MPE that we haven't really, we don't have time to cover. But I mean, one of the hard, hard things about it is that you do need to kind of know the state of your, your MIDI port that's coming in. You need to know whether your MPE and what your zone is and what your channels, uh, what your channel assignment is to be able to know how to deal with the data correctly. So if, so you've kind of got to know, am I dealing with regular single channel MIDI? I'm going to edit in this way. Am I dealing with MP MIDI? MIDI? I need to edit it in this way. Um, I'm hoping, obviously I don't know anything, I'm hoping that MIDI CI will help, help us actually identify better what kind of MIDI we're talking to. I think at four, the, MIDI, the MMA are going to be talking, so we can grill them with some questions. <laughs> Gen generally, generally, as a plugin writer, as a plugin writer, if you build an MPE en engine, it's fairly well backwards compatible with a mono, with conventional monotambral MIDI. Uh, for hosts, there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, you started answering this already, but um, you touched on like channel mapping and some of these problems and how you deal with it if you're like the host developer. But as okay. a lowly plugin developer, mm -hmm. um, we find that you know there's certain synths, not to mention any names, but starts with A ends with Bolton. <laughs> um, that you know they squash everything down to one channel, so we just yes. lose MP, no doubt about it. Yeah. Now, luckily, uh, Rolly's put in the legacy mode, so you can enable legacy mode. Everything works pretty well. You still get a lot of the bends and stuff. You can't have individual notes. You kind of lose the differentiation, yeah, yeah. As, yeah. as I understand it. Um, that works great. I guess my question is about the future. Like, what kind of buy-in and motion have you had, both from like the MIDI people and the DAW creators and everything else, such that you know, because right now it's a Bit of a pain in the butt. You can detect. Luckily, we can detect which DAWs running the plugin. Maybe enable le legacy mode just if it's certain DAWs, etc., yeah. etc. But it'd be nice if that was all uh, more seamless. Well, so it's it's a ratified part of the MIDI standard mm -hmm. now. Uh, I mean, I think the reason that we were able to build MPE and the reason that Ableton didn't build channels in was kind of the same reason that after the advent of plugins, when everything went from hardware to software, we weren't worrying about the five-pin plugs anymore. Uh, you know, channel became somewhat superfluous. So we were able to overload that for expressive MIDI. And round about the same time, Ableton kind of said, well, this is legacy stuff. Why do we need to support it? So it's a, it was a kind of a, it was a reasonable decision on their part at the time. But uh, there's good support in Logic, GarageBand, Cubase, uh, Bitwig, Traction. And it should get better in the future. I, I think so. I mean, there's a, you know, um, these are these are selling very well, so we see there being customer demand for it. I'm optimistic about it. And I think again, so what? <coughs> um, uh, so if people don't know about it, what um, uh, MMA came out with in January is uh, something called MIDI CI, which is basically a protocol for communicating with devices to decide what the setup of that device is. Um, they've they've kind of put they've published the transportation of that system, but not no actual implementations of it yet. But hopefully that's going to include the, the information you need to decide what should I set my instrument into. Um, there, is actually, there are actually set up messages for, for MP instruments that are in the standard. The only problem is there is no way to query what the, what the setup is. So I'm hoping MIDI CI is going to solve those problems. Yeah.